Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gil. I'm the CEO of 3D Optics. I'm happy to host uh, Keith Myers for another live session. Um, um, I hope it will be an interesting one for you in uh, this uh, uh, session. So without further ado, Keith, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Gil. Well, welcome everybody to another 3D Optics live webinar. My name is Keith Myers and I'm an optical designer working with 3D Optics. Today, I'll be guiding you through custom lens design in the 3D Optics web-based platform. Now, this is an exciting tool to use if you have a custom lens with known specifications and you wanna add it to your optical system, or if you have a lens design in mind and want to easily build it up and run analysis on it. Okay, so with that said, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Let's go ahead and jump right into the design. Okay, now there are two ways to generate a custom design in 3D optics. The first is to take a template lens and change the lens prescription. And the second is, is to use the 3D optics custom tool to shape the surface of a lens. Now, before we begin, let's look at our optical system here. I've added a couple components to start out with. So we have a light source on the left and a few detectors on the right. Let's click on the light source and see what the settings are. So we'll go to the ribbon bar over here and go to light source settings. Okay, so the source type is a plain way. This will be simulating a laser. For the appearance, we've changed the ray color to red. Now, this is a nice little feature because if we have many sources or polychromatic sources, we can change the ray color and see how they propagate through our system. Since we only have one source, it's not too important, so it's more cosmetic, but let me show, how, show you how this can be useful. Let's go over here and click on our light source and let's duplicate this. All right, now we're going to co-locate our light sources. So we'll go over here to the move, rotate button. Okay, so now our light sources are in the same position. Next thing we're gonna do is we're going to pretend these are different field sources. So we're gonna angle them a bit. Okay, now if we propagate the simulation with all the light sources, we're gonna see that all the sources are red. So if we're trying to track this through an optical system, this will be a little bit difficult because we won't know which rays belong to which source. So one way we can help is we can change the ray color palette. So we've got a couple options here. Uh, spectral ray colors, we can change that. Since this is a monochromatic source and I just duplicated it, it won't change the rays. Intensity base, we can use that. But with this setup, I haven't had it move through any optical components, so that's not going to change it either. We can do directional ray colors, but that doesn't help a lot. The most helpful is defining user-defined colors. And when we do that, we can select our light sources, and then we can change the ray color appearance, and this will help us track it through our optical system. So we'll make that one blue. We'll pin this guy really quick. We'll make this one green. Okay, now that's a good contrast. And as we develop our optical system and these field points move through our optical system, we'll be able to tell that red rays were the on-axis source, blue rays were the 10 degree source, and green rays were the 20 degree source. So a nice little feature here in case you're using polychromatic sources or different field points, so you can easily visualize how your optical, say, op optical system is propagating. Okay. Let's go ahead and get rid of those extra sources because we won't need them for this webinar. We'll propagate the simulation again to get rid of those extra field points. And we'll turn off the light source here. Okay, let's go back and continue looking at our light source settings. So went through the appearance. Now for the number of rays, we're using 100 layout rays and this is for the visual analysis here. And we are use, using 100 analysis rays now, there's a toggle button down here. Since this is a monochromatic source, it doesn't matter which one of these toggles we use, but if we had a, pro a polychromatic source, we may want to use a million analysis rays per wavelength or total. So that is an option here. For spatial information, we're using a circular source with a radius of 22.5 millimeters. 
Now, this is 90% clear aperture of a 50.8 millimeter lens. Now, this is just kind of an arbitrary number I've chosen, uh, but we can use more or less the lens. But we do want to specify some clear aperture, and we generally do this with the radius of the light source. Okay, the source ray density pattern, this again is just visual, is circular. For the angular information, we really want this light source pointing directly down the optical axis because we're going to be testing our lenses here. So we're going to keep this all to zero. For our test wavelength, we are going to use 632.8 nanometers, which corresponds to helium neon laser. We're giving it a power of five milliwatts and we're making the source unpolarized. Okay, great. Now let's move on to our detectors here. So these are a little bit smaller because we're going to be, be looking at the focus of our lenses here. And as you can see, we have the transparency moved up to 100% so we can kind of see it as an easy contrast against the breadboard. Now our detector elements are all two millimeters by two millimeters. So the half width would be one by one millimeters. And if we look in the outline bar over here, expand this out a little bit, our first detector is called a reference detector. Now, again, we're going to be using these detectors for the, to find the focus of the focal point of the lenses. So we're gonna have a reference detector reference to the back of the lens. And then we will know if the smallest spot size is on one of these detectors, where it is. Now, these numbers mean how many millimeters beyond the reference detector. So we have one to five millimeters farther. Okay. Now for positioning, the way we've positioned our detectors because they, we want them to move as a group, the first detector is reference to the global coordinate system. Now, let me show you that. We'll go up to the taskbar here and show link lines. Now this is going to tell us where all of our objects are referenced to in the 3D layout. And as you can see, the first detector is referenced to the global coordinate system here in the center of the breadboard. And so is our light source. Now, if we zoom back into our detectors and click off of it, we can see that each detector is referenced to the, te the detector in front of it. So let me show you what I mean. If we move these detectors, we can see the link lines a bit more clearly. Now, we're going to do this because we want to move these detectors around as we're analyzing our system. And it's easier just to move one lens and have all the other lens or detectors and have all the other detectors follow in line. Okay, so let's move these detectors back into their proper place. And we'll turn off show link lines. Okay, so this nested detector system is going to be important later on. Okay, so now that we've described the source and detectors in our optical system, let's get started designing a custom lens. So the first way we're going to do this is a very simple method. We're going to change some of the lens parameters, such as the radius of curvature, thickness, and diameter. And we do need to grab a template lens. So we're going to right click and pull up the open optics menu. And when we click on this, this is going to bring us down to the 3D optics catalog. Okay. Now we're going to want to use the filter searchers here on the left. We're going to search for a lens. Now, we want to search for a biconvex lens or a convex convex lens. All right, great. Now, because we just need a template, it doesn't really ma matter what the lens prescription is at this time. So we'll just choose the first in the list. All right, great. So we'll zoom in here. Now we're going to recenter our lens in our optical system. Perfect. So this is going to be between our light source and our detectors. Okay, now we're going to change the lens prescription. So we're gonna right click on the lens. We're gonna go up to the ribbon bar, click optic settings and go to optical settings. Perfect, there we go. Okay, so this is our lens prescription. Now, the first thing we're going to do is change the name to lens design simple. This will be our first design. We're going to go ahead and save that, and then we're going to go back into lens prescription. So we can also right click and go to the optical settings here. Okay. Now the tab underneath is the optics geometrical properties. This is what we're going to use to change the parameters of our lens. 
And below that are the calculated focal lengths, the front, the back, and the effective. Now, these are going to dynamically change as we start changing some of these parameters. In addition, the lens viewer, the 3D lens viewer here, will also dynamically change the lens as we change these parameters. OK. The tab under it is Material Info, so we can change the glass substrate here and also the design wavelength. So this little button over here will pop up a window showing us the refractive index through all the wavelengths that are valid for this material and some information about the polarization reflections here. Okay. So we want to start with the optics geometrical properties up here and we'll start changing these around. We'll have a 50.8 millimeter lens and we're going to change the center thickness to 12 millimeters, the front radius to positive 75, and the back radius to minus 75. Now we are using standard sign convention here, so the front curvature will be positive and the rear curvature will be negative because we have a biconvex lens. And as you can see, the focal lengths all update and the lens did as well. Okay. So we're also going to change the glass substrate. We're going to choose NSF 11. And this is about halfway down the list. There it is. Perfect. And again, everything dynamically updates as we're changing these parameters. Now we're going to change the design wavelength to match our light source. OK, perfect. As you can see, again, everything updates. This is a really nice feature, so you don't have to constantly figure out what all the changes do to your lens. OK. So let's save this. And then we're going to propagate the simulation. So we're going to look at the light rays and how the, how the lens interacts with them. OK. So here is the area where it is focusing the light. Now, we can see a lot of different focuses, so some of the spherical aberration from this lens. So if we zoom in a little bit, we see a focus here from the outer diameter of the lens. We see a focus here and here and here and a couple others. OK, so a biconvex lens is really good at collecting a point source that is diverging. However, a plano convex lens is much better at focusing collimated light. And since we have collimated light here, we're going to change this lens design. Let's go ahead and click on the lens, go back to the prescription. And we're going to change this radius to 0. Now, I do want to point out that we can make one surface planar if we have a biconvex or a biconcave lens. However, if we do try to make both surfaces planar, then 3D optics will not allow that because this is supposed to be a lens, not a flat object. OK, so now we've made our plano convex lens. And let's note the back focal length here. So the back focal length is going to be 88.8 .8 millimeters. So we'll need that a little bit later. Actually, I apologize. We need to update the design wavelength. There we go. So 89, about 89 and a half millimeters at our design wavelength for the back focal length. And that's going to be the focal length from the back planar surface. Let's go ahead and save this. All right, great. Let's propagate the light rays again. OK. That looks much better. So instead of having a lot of spherical aberrations exaggerated, the plano convex lens is going to reduce those things. So that's fantastic. OK, now let's go to the top taskbar and into the analysis portal. And we're going to start analyzing our spot size. OK, so let's look at the parameters we've set for our detectors. Now, the analysis is going to be an incoherent spot irradiance. We're using 1 million analysis rays, which matches with how many analysis rays we put in our light source. And we're using 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. OK, now all of the detectors are the same, so they're all set up the same way. Now, I'm going to go down here. And before I run analysis, I'm going to turn on the turbo button. Now, this is going to use some more GPU resources, but it will uh, quickly get the analysis done. And this is available to premium users. Let's go ahead and run the analysis. And down here on the right, the notifications will tell us when our analysis is finished.
Okay, perfect. And our analysis is now done. Now, what we want to do is we want to see a side-by-side -side comparison of the spot size at all the detector locations. So we're gonna go and hit this compare button on each window so we can pull up all the windows at the same time and see where the focus of this lens is. And we'll go down here and select compare selected. Okay, great. So it looks like the reference plus one is where our focus is. We'll click on that and expand it out a little bit. Okay, so let's zoom into this. All right, that looks like a pretty spherical spot size and it's very small, so it looks about our focus. Now we can also change our display type up here. We can use false color, which is what we're using now, or grayscale. So kind of whatever is your preference for viewing the spot. I like false color, so we'll keep it there. Now, if you need to do additional analysis, there we go. Now, if you need to do additional analysis on the spot size, we can come down here to the three bar button and we can download our image or the pixel data into an XLS format. In addition, we can change from linear view, which we're at now to a logarithmic view, if we so choose, but I like the linear view for this one. Okay, let's go ahead and close this down and also the analysis compare. And let's look at the reference plus one phase. So we'll add that analysis in here. Change that to a thousand by a thousand and we'll rerun the analysis. All right, great. Now notice that it won't rerun all the analysis windows because they've already, re they've already been run. It's just going to update this new analysis here. And that's a nice feature because we're not gonna be wasting GPU resources. Okay, so it looks like we've got some aberrations in here, which makes sense. We're using just a spherical lens. And the only thing we've done is change the radius of curvature. So these spherical lens are going to give us quite a bit of aberration here. All right, let's close this and close the analysis. Perfect. So that is a simple way to create a lens in 3D optics. What we can do is put this in our optical system. And if we want to change the surface properties of the optics we have in there, we can do that. And we can also look at the way our lens, uh, the lens shape changes the aberrations in our systems. Okay. So now we're going to move on to a more complex method of creating a lens. So we're going to create an A-sphere. Now, when we are creating A-spheres, we do have to use a template with at least one curved surface, uh, which describes any lens. But if we want two curved surfaces, we do, again, have to choose a lens that has two curved surfaces. So planar surfaces will not give you the option to change them. Okay, so let's go ahead and move this lens out of the way. And we're going to just reuse this lens for our A-sphere. So we're going to go to the ribbon bar and duplicate. Perfect. We'll grab the duplicated lens, put it in our optical system here, set it in the same position as the last lens. Okay, great. Now we're going to go to the lens prescription again. Okay, same thing as last time, but now we're going to rename this as a sphere. All right, great. Now that's going to update the name. We're going to save it really quick. Go back into the prescription settings. And now we can start making some of these changes. Now for this method, we're actually going to use the 3D optics tool to change the surface shape. So we're going to keep all of these the same, except for the radius. We're going to change that to a thousand. I'll explain that in a minute. Resave the lens. And we're gonna go down here to optical surfaces. The material info, we're gonna keep this all the same. So we're gonna select the front surface here, okay? And then we're going to go down to surface shape. The other two settings, simulation and scattering info will be saved for another webinar. So we're going to select the surface shape and we're gonna enable the surface shape component. Now we have a little drop down here, so we're going to see the surface shapes that we can choose for this surface. Okay, so we're going to have three A-sphere terms. 
So we're going to have an A sphere where we can use all the terms, even and odd. An odd A sphere where obviously only the odd terms are used and an even A sphere where the even terms are used. To start out, we're going to look at the A sphere, but we're eventually just going to use the even A sphere because we want a symmetric lens. Now, the other two terms, Zernike fringe sag and Jones matrix are really good and dynamic tools, but we're not gonna use them in this webinar. The Zernike fringe sag is really good at describing black box system aberrations and the Jones matrix is a polarization modeling surface. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to A-sphere. And we are going to use two terms and we're going to set some coefficients so we can see how these terms change the lens. Okay. So the first term is linear in R. So this is going to give us a slanted surface or when combined with other terms, it will give us a point at the center of the lens. So let's change this to 0 0.2. All right, great. And now we can see that we have a slanted surface here. All right, we'll set that to zero. Okay, so the, tech, the second term is the first term in an even A-sphere surface. And we are going to use this term because we have already set the radius of curvature to a very high number. And because this is a spherical lens, the conic constant is zero. So the reason we choose one or the other, either the first term in the even A-sphere or the radius of curvature and the conic, conic constant to use is because these terms will conflict with each other if we use all of them. So typically you're going to see either the radius of curvature and the conic constant defined or the first term in the even A sphere defined. So since we, we are going to use this, let's change this a little bit. We're going to do 0 0.001. Okay. Now this defines our shape here. As you can see, we got a little bit of curvature. Now let's increase this by an order of magnitude. All right, great. Now we've got a lot more curvature here. Perfect. So now that we understand how these terms work, let's move to a, the even A sphere and see how we can change these terms and create a lens. Okay, so we're gonna set up three terms. And because this is an a, even A sphere, we're gonna have the second, fourth, and sixth term. So we're going to fill in these coefficients. The first one will be 0 0.01. This coefficient will be one to the negative eighth. And the last coefficient will be one to the negative 10th. Now you can't see the surface moving, the shape moving too much because these terms are very, very small, but they are having effect. Okay. So let's go back here. We have all these the same. Let's change our design. Or actually, we don't need to change our design wavelength. One thing to note is if we're using surface shapes, that these calculated values do not take those into account. So these calculated values for the focal length only are only determined by these parameters up here that we can change. Okay, so the, our lens is saved. Let's go back into the 3D layout. Now what we wanna do is we want to reference our detectors to the back of our lens now. So we're gonna go into the ribbon bar, go to select reference coordinate system. And we're going to choose, if we expand out the outliner bar, the A sphere we just made, and we wanna choose the back surface here. All right, perfect. Now we'll know exactly how far the reference detector is from the back surface as we move it around. And we'll move this a little bit closer. So let's uh, actually propagate simulation here so we can see where the new focus is. Great. Okay, so we're going to move this a little bit closer. Maybe 50. Move it back a little bit more. Okay. We'll go up to the analysis portal here and we'll run the analysis. And as this goes on, we'll do the same thing. We're going to look for our focus using the detectors again. Perfect, all right, all of our analyses have finished. Now these are the same set of detectors. So we'll just do compare selected again and they'll pull up all five detectors again. Okay, great. So it looks like 
the reference plus two is going to be our focus. All right, I'll expand that out a little bit. Okay, that looks pretty good. That looks like a symmetrical spot and it looks very, very small. So we can call that our focus. And again, because the detectors are spaced out one millimeter, that's the focus plus or minus a millimeter. We'll go ahead and close this down. What we want to look at is the coherent phase. But we want to use the detector where the focus is. And this is plus two. All right, great. So we're going to look at this and see how these A sphere terms have affected our beam. OK, so that looks pretty good. There's definitely some spherical aberration here. Uh, we've just chosen some random terms for our A sphere, so we can't expect too much. There's no uh, design optimization for this, but this looks pretty good. OK. So actually, let's go back into our lens prescription and let's try to change one term here and see what the how the output changes. Okay, so everything's the same. We'll go to our optical surface and now we're gonna change the last term by an order of magnitude. Okay, close this out. And now we have to re-reference our detectors because the surface has changed. So it deselected that and selected the global coordinate system. So we'll do that really quick. The back of the lens, perfect. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the analysis portal and run the analysis. And this will rerun the analyses for all of the detectors because we've changed one of the surfaces. So 3D Optics knows that it needs to rerun all the analysis. Okay, so let's look at the coherent phase again. All right, so this is a little bit different. Looks like we may have made it a little bit worse because we have some more aberrations out here. And again, expected when we're just inserting coefficients into the aspheric terms. If we're not, if we don't have an ideal optimization or we don't know what the terms need to do, go up or go down, we're going to get output such as this. Okay. Let's go ahead and close that. All right. So this still looks like a good lens. We've got a good focus over here. Uh, we've got a phase profile that has some aberrations in it, but that's okay. Now, this is one method to create an A-sphere lens, but a more practical use that will probably be more common to you is to use data from a manufacturer to add aspheric lenses to our optical system, either a custom lens that we've had designed or a lens that is not in the 3D Optics catalog. Okay, so I've actually downloaded a spec sheet from Edmund Optics and Thor Labs, and I'll bring those up right now. Let's look at the A-sphere ter terms that they use for their lenses. Now, I want to point out that this is not manufactured data, and these are readily available spec sheets from their respective websites. Okay, so let's look at the Edmund Optics lens first. So the substrate is NBK7. And if we come down here, we can actually see the terms now for the A-sphere surface that they describe. So as I have said originally, the first term using the radius of curvature and the conic constant will conflict with the first aspheric term. This is because they're both functions of y squared. So that's why we're going to set either both of these terms to zero to get rid of this, or set this term to zero to get rid of this. It's typical that you're going to have one or the other. Uh, not always, but it is typical. So let's go to the coefficient table down here. So we can see that they are using the radius of curvature and the conic constant to define this lens. And as we suspect, they set the first asphere term to zero, the first even asphere term to zero, and they're using the fourth and the sixth term. And we can automatically tell that they're using an a even asphere for this. Okay, fantastic. So let's go and look at the Thor Labs lens. Very similar to the Edmund Optics lens. Here's their aspheric lens equation. They just completely omit the first even asphere term, so we assume it's zero. They are again using the radius of curvature and the conic constant to define their sphere. They're also using the fourth 
the sixth, the eighth, and the 10th terms. Now note that the terms do get smaller at, or the coefficients get smaller as the terms increase in size because you need less of a perturbation. Okay, so this is commonly what we're going to find is we have an A-sphere that we wanna to insert to, into 3D optics, either one that's not there or one we've had designed specifically for our optical system. Now let's go ahead and insert the Edmund optics lens into 3D optics. So I'll move this over here. Okay. We'll bring up the list of terms here. Now to do this, we're gonna move our first A-sphere that we created. Now, and we're going to look for another A-sphere. Now we do need to use an A-sphere because we are going to not use the surface shape component tool. So we'll go back to the 3D optics catalog. We'll look for lenses and we'll look for an A-spheric lens. Again, because this is a template lens, we can just choose the first one in the list. That's not a problem. All right, great. So let's go ahead and move this into our optical system here. 100, perfect. Now let's go into the lens prescription. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is rename this a sphere two. Perfect. And once this loads up, we will save it. Great. Go back into the prescription. All right. So we're going to start loading the optical parameters and coefficients into this lens, just like Edmund Optics had it. So the diameter is 25 millimeters. The first radius is 19.38. Second radius is Plano, so that's zero. The center thickness is 9.72. The conic constant is negative 66989. Okay. Again, the first even a sphere term is coefficient is zero. The fourth is 1.87679. I apologize, just seven. And then to the negative sixth. Okay. And the last term is 8.9302 to the negative 10th. Okay, perfect and they do not have any higher order terms. So we're gonna set all of these to zero. Perfect. Okay, and if you remember the material they used were, was NBK7, so we're going to insert that here. Perfect. Now we can set the design wavelength here, but as you can see, we don't have any focal length calculations because this is an A-sphere. Uh, we could change it to look at the index refraction, but we don't really care about that too much. So we'll just set, we'll just leave everything as is for now. Okay, let's go ahead and save the lens. All right, now this is smaller than our light source that we've been using. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the radius of the light source. So we've got a spatial information. And if you remember the, actually not if you remember, we, we haven't gone over this yet. The clear aperture specified for the Edmund optics lens is 22.5 millimeters. So we wanna insert that in so we get good results from our analysis. So that's gonna be 11.25 millimeters radius. Perfect. Let's go ahead and propagate the simulation. Excellent. All right. So if you notice, that looks like a pretty good spot. The rays are all converging to a single point and we don't have, it doesn't look like we have multiple, multiple focuses, foci as you move through the beam. So that's good. That means this was optimized for focusing. Okay. So now we're going to reference our detectors to this new A sphere. I'm going to go over here and select reference. And we're going to use a sphere two, the current uh, lens we're working on, go to the back, and then we will put these detectors where they need to be. Perfect. Let's make sure the lens is positioned correctly. Okay. 
and the reference detectors as well. Perfect. Okay, so it looks like the detectors do need to come a little bit closer. So let's see where we need to put these. We'll do 27, maybe 29. Okay, so it looks pretty good. One of these detectors will be at the focus now. Let's move the outliner bar here. Okay, so let's go back up to the analysis portal and we're going to rerun the analysis. Okay, that looks pretty good. And again, our notifications down here will tell us when our analysis is done. Okay, looks like all the analyses are finished. So again, we're going to compare the selected, compare selected to find that focus. Okay, that looks interesting. It looks like reference plus two is our focus for this lens. Let's expand that out a little bit. All right, now you'll notice this looks like a much better spot size. It's a little bit smaller and more focused. That's fantastic. Okay, so let's close that out. Let's also look at the coherent phase. We'll expand this guy again. Okay. So there are some aberrations here, but you can see that this is a very, very small spot size and the aberrations aren't too big. Now with the other ones, we had aberrations that were spilling all over the beam and creating kind of a larger spot size. But this is an A-sphere that's been specifically designed to focus down light. So it's been optimized using those higher order terms. Okay, great. Close that down. There's a question. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at the spot size analysis. The one last thing. So the reference detector is at 29. And from our analysis, we know that the reference plus two detector is where the focus is. So if we bring back up the spec sheet from Alan Edmonds or Edmund Optics, we can see down here that the back focal length at their design wavelength of 587.6 nanometers is about 31 millimeters. All right, that's fantastic because that's almost exactly where we have found our focus. So the reference detector is at 29 millimeters from the back of the lens. And we know that reference detector two, so 31 millimeters from the lens is where we found the smallest spot size. All right, that's great. Okay, so creating custom lenses or inserting specialized lenses is a great tool to quickly customize optics into our optical system in 3D optics. We can change surface parameters to see how the optical system optimizes from there and even how the aberrations change throughout our system. So this concludes our 3D Optics webinar. I want to thank everybody for coming and joining us, navigating and getting familiar with the platform and the features we've used today. I hope you found this feature useful and are more familiar now with the platform. So this design will be available shortly in the warehouse after this webinar. So I want to thank everybody again, and I'll hand it back to Gil. Hi, Keith. Thank you very much for this session. Um, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you uh, once again. Uh, I think it was very beneficial and very informative. Uh, for the audience, I would like to mention that uh, by, by the early, uh, on early August, we are planning to launch uh, a new uh, version with exciting new capabilities, uh, 3D polarization, diffraction, uh, APIs is going to be there. Uh, and uh, we are uh, going to uh, take away the uh, discount. The 50% discount uh, is, is, is ending uh, at the end of this month. Uh, so you do have a chance uh, to purchase the license for 50% discount up until uh, next uh, Tuesday. So if you had intention to purchase it, so I encourage you to do that uh, before Tuesday. So once again, thank you very much, Keith. Thank you very much for participating. You will get an email with uh, the recording of uh, this session. And uh, I will see you in our uh, next live session. Hopefully it will be uh, in mid or toward the end of August. Bye, everyone.